Wow, this is like a reporter's dream. A whole room full of private investigators. Wouldn't, what, what I wouldn't want to know, what I wouldn't give to know what you know. All the secrets in your head. Uh, a lot of news stories out there waiting to be told, I bet. But today, I'm going to share some secrets with you. Because, let's face it, private investigators and investigative reporters are after the same thing. We're after the truth, right? When I get it, I want to shout it to the world. I want to write it down and have people read it. You people, probably not so much, right? You're probably working for lawyers who, persnickety lawyers who like to keep the facts to themselves. I'm cool with that. I get that. I respect it. But if you haven't already, there may come a time when you get that big case. It could happen any time. You might get a jewelry store theft case, and it turns into a Lindsay Lohan stole my necklace case, right? Uh, a mundane domestic or, or a divorce case may turn into a front page scandalous murder. You never know. You may catch a bank fraud case, and it turns into something like the Bernie Madoff case. When that happens, that's when people like me come flocking in in droves. I know most of you, okay, many of you, most of you in this room uh, are thinking to yourself, why do I care if the media comes in? I'm going to ignore them. My, my client would be furious if I spoke to a reporter. Look, private investigators and investigative reporters are after the same thing. We are going to be in the same field. And you're going to get that big case where people like me come flocking in. You probably think to yourself, why the hell would I ever talk to a reporter? Well, the simple answer is because I can either be your pal or I can be your worst nightmare. I'm going to be digging where you are digging. I'm going to be talking to some of the people you talk to, and I might even know some people you don't even know to talk to. I'm here to tell you today that if you put in a little bit of research time, like call it media surveillance time, you will get to know who the valuable reporters are in your area. You'll also be able to make a, a, a valuable contact with a public person who can turn down the audio a little bit. <laughs> Hello. Wow, I better stand back. You'll also be making a, a contact with, with a public person, a reporter, who can A, introduce you to other important people, or B, give you tips on other cases that are coming around the bend. But still, you might be thinking, this is just too dangerous. Uh, you know, my client would kill me if they ever knew that I was dealing with a reporter. Well, on the big cases, say like this one, Jerry Sandusky, where I just came from Belfont, Pennsylvania, covering that trial, uh, or this one, Dr. Conrad Murray, which I also covered for Newsweek and their website, thedailybeast.com, we, the media, are the ones that are driving this engine. You guys are trying to figure out your information, but we are driving the bus. Once we get involved, your whole life will change. It doesn't, it, it goes from being a private, private investigative case you're working on to, on to a very, very public case. It was the doggedness of a 24-year-old reporter in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Her name is Sarah Ganim, 24 years old. This is the one who peeled back the years and years of institutional protection that Jerry Sandusky had to reveal what was really going on. She won a Pulitzer Prize, 24 years old. Now, if you had caught this case, say for one of the victims or for Jerry Sandusky, wouldn't you have wanted to know what was in this woman's head? Again, 24 years old, she won a Pulitzer Prize. This partnership with reporters like her and me and countless other, others happens all the time. It, uh, it could be if you're working on a case and you get a leak. Your own persnickety lawyer who hired you may have been the one to leak to someone like me because they like to test the waters. They like to get their side of the story out first. And if they don't do it, guess what? The client does it. Or the client's best friend will call you up to tell you the real story. It happens to me all the time.
Sometimes good comes from it, and sometimes bad comes from it. It's all how you handle the situation when you talk to a reporter, if you decide to. Um, and it's all about which reporter you choose to talk to, and I'll give you some tips on that uh, in just a minute. But first, let me tell you about the first time I got a phone call from a big city private detective. It was this guy. Remember this guy? Anthony Pelicano. He's now doing time, couldn't happen to a nicer fella, for um, strong-arming an L.A. Times correspondent named Anita Bush, and a whole lot of other things he did. Uh, but back to why he called me. <laughs> it was 1993. I had just moved from New York to Los Angeles, so I didn't know I was supposed to be afraid of this guy. I was working for the TV show Hard Copy, if you remember that, and at the time, I had just aired uh, some stories about the Hollywood madam Heidi Fleiss. Remember her? Boy, she wishes she looked this good today. <clears throat> From her story, I got a whole raft of leads, and I did more and more stories about Heidi Fleiss. And I came to learn about a young woman, a beautiful young woman, an underaged Russian girl. And she had been in the house the night the cops came to arrest Heidi Fleiss. She told, to me, uh, told me at a meet that we had that the police had taken one look at her being 15 years old, and said, oh, geez, we do not need to fill out all the paperwork on an underage hooker. Gather up your stuff and scram, which is what she did. And she told me at this meet that one of the things she accidentally scooped up was Heidi Fleiss's black book. Who? She gave it to me. She gave it to me. And I grandly held it up on the air later and said, hey, everybody, I got Heidi Fleiss's black book and it's full of Hollywood names and made a big splash with it. I Xeroxed it, every page of it, twice. And then I made a big grand splash of giving the book back to Heidi Fleiss as a pretense to meet with her once she got out of jail. It was high drama. Oh, I look back at it now and sort of cringe. But think of the impact that that, that made in the early 90s. The Hollywood madam who caters to top shelf clientele, studio heads, famous actors, high profile directors, men all over Hollywood were shaking in their boots and laid out on the pages before me, my Xerox copy, copies, were their names, their addresses, their phone numbers, and yes, their sexual preferences. I was sitting on a gold mine. That's why Mr. Pelicano was calling me. He didn't give me his real name. I figured it out later when I heard him at a news conference. I heard his voice and it dawned on me who he was. But he, he said to me on this day that he was simply calling to warn me that if Mr. So-and-so's name from such-and-such -such a studio, if he heard his name mentioned on hard copy in connection with the Heidi book, well, I would be sued. He was being Mr. Benevolent. He was warning me that I might be sued. As he was talking to me, I rifled through my pages, and I realized that Mr. So-and-so's name was on in the book, and I sort of blanched at his sexual preferences, but I kept it to myself. Pelicano called me... <laughs> I didn't bother to tell him not to worry because my boss was never ever going to let me broadcast the names in that book because hard copy on the Paramount lot, there were several Paramount executives in that book. <laughs> Only later did I realize what a bully, what a criminal, frankly, Pelicano was. Um, this is a guy who uh, represented everybody in Hollywood. Um, let's see, Michael Ovitz, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Seagal, and Michael Jackson. Now, it was that time when I started to cover Michael Jackson. This is him in prison. Made me smile. When I started to cover Michael Jackson, that's when Pelicano really moved in on me. And that's when he held a news conference where I heard his voice. And I remembered, as he stood next to Jackson's attorney, Howard Weitzman, that's the voice who called me on uh, the Heidi Fleiss case. Uh, once I started covering the Michael Jackson case, Pelicano was his private detective, hired by Howard Weitzman. Um, I, I was threatened in less obvious ways than just phone calls. 
I worked the story for weeks, and then months, and then ultimately years. I wrote a book about my 15 years investigating Michael Jackson. Um, and I worked pretty much as a lone wolf. And then one day, the hard copy attorneys came to me, and they knew things about what I was doing and where I was going and who I was talking to that they never, ever should have known. And I began to think that my cubicle telephone was being tapped. I mentioned it to one of my bosses who sort of rolled his eyes and said, yeah, yeah, sure, drama queen. But I decided that I needed to try to prove whether or not it was. So my husband and I, he's also in the media, he's an anchor man for CBS Radio now in New York, we cooked up a, a little scheme. We were afraid that the house was being bugged, frankly. So we took a walk in the neighborhood and we decided on a plan. So at 11 o'clock the next day, my husband called me on my office cubicle telephone and he said to me, how's that special coming that you're doing on Anthony Pelicano, that half hour special? And I said, oh, it's going great. He is going to die when he sees this. Michael Jackson is going to fire his ass when he sees this half hour special we're doing on Anthony Pelicano. Again, I don't know I'm supposed to be afraid of this guy. I've just moved from New York. I sat down at my cubicle, hung up with my husband, sat down at the cubicle, and I watched this little clock, this little tick-tock clock on my desk. 22 minutes later, a Paramount attorney came to me from another building, tapped me on the shoulder. Her name is Cindy Teal. I'll never forget it. And she said, hey, tell me about this half-hour special you're doing on Anthony Pelicano. I could honestly say there was no special on Anthony Pelicano. Why was she asking me? Oh, well, she said, I just heard from somebody that you were. Well, kept my mouth shut, but I checked her out. Cindy Teal had come to the Paramount lot and been assigned to the television show Hard Copy to vet all of our scripts from the offices of Howard Weitzman. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't even have to explain that to you, do I? Howard Weitzman, by the way, would ultimately sue me for $100 million for investigating this man. Also, while giving depositions in that case, I stored a lot of very sensitive documents and notebooks in the back of my car because we have an open cubicle system at hard copy, and frankly, I just didn't trust leaving the, the files out in the open. So I put them in the back seat of my car, I put a leather jacket over them, and there they sat, locked up, in a building, I always parked in the same place, right outside the lawyer's building on the Paramount lot, in a place called the Blue Tank. This is the tank that they fill with water and they do water scenes in when they have to. One day, during this deposition procedure, another hard copy attorney named Adam Bram came to me, and he said, uh, I remember I was in the newsroom on somebody's phone because after that, I just sort of traveled around and used willy-nilly phones. I'd even go out and use coin box phones on the, on the lot. And he said, isn't that your little silver BMW out there? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, the back window's broken and the door is open. I said, what? Was there a leather coat there? Yeah. So we went running out and all the documents were gone. This is on the Paramount lot. You know what the big gates, the big secure, the big security? Yeah, great, amazing. All of my documents were gone. After that, of course, there was a big meeting with all of the top bosses at Paramount, and I told them. I told them about the, the tapping. I told them about the attorney who shouldn't have known what I was doing. I told them about some random vandalism at our home. Um, I told them that I thought my home phone was bugged. And Paramount called in a electronics group of sweep. They swept my house. They also gave me guards to take me to and from work. Um, by the way, on that sweep, they didn't find anything in my house, but they did find tampering at the phone box at the bottom of my hill. Was it connected? I can't say that. Anyway, after all that, I vowed never ever to deal with a private detective again, okay? Sorry, I just, it was sort of soured on you guys. And then, these two came into my life. Dan O'Hanks, along with his partner, the late Fred Vallis, Vallis is on the left. Back in the day, these were our PIs at hard copy. 
I can't tell you everything they did for us because, you know, I'd have to kill you if I did. Uh, this is what they looked like when they were out in the field for us. <laughs> Suffice it to say that Dano and Fred turned my head around about your profession. I came to discover that there really could be a symbiosis between private investigators and investigative reporters. What a pair these two made, I'll tell you. We worked Heidi Fleiss together. We worked the Michael Jackson case, O.J. Simpson. They brought me the drug connection people with, f that were connected with O.J. Simpson. That was a, a great coup for us. Got him on a uh, polygraph test, and he admitted that he was selling drugs to O.J. Simpson. We also did a couple of fascinating murder cases. I could go on and on about how I came to discover that with a little bit of trust... They could get what they needed because they had other clients other than hard copy. And I could get what I needed. Once we learned to trust each other, we realized pretty fast that three people work in a case is better than two or just one. I could, by the very power vested in me, get a lot of documents. You know, hello, I'm a reporter and I have the right to see this and this and this government document. They by the very power vested in their very creative way of speaking to people and gathering information could bring to the table lots of things like informants, phone numbers, addresses, license plate numbers, surveillance photos and video. And it was all legal at the time, may I say. It was legal, <laughs> really. Um, some of the laws have changed uh, since then. But uh, these two were also very good to cover my back when I had a meet in a weird place, because they carried guns, and I did not. We lost Fred in April 2005, but Dano and I still work together to this day. He lives in uh, the Los Angeles area, I live in New York, but we still work together, and if you don't believe me, <laughs> you can look to the back of the room, because the man is sitting right there. He's a member of your association, California PI license number 23897. Since Dan and uh, Fred, I've worked with scores of other PIs across the country. Some of them don't mind me saying so, and some made me vow that their names will never pass my lips, and I'm cool with that. That's good. Sometimes I just learn that a certain PI is working a case, and I call them up, introduce myself. I'm used to getting hung up on <laughs> or ignored. Uh, like with the PI who worked on the case for Jose Baez. Oh, that's the three of us again. See, I'm all messed up. Jose Baez is the one who represented Casey Anthony. I covered that trial too. I tried to call the PI and tell them after she was acquitted of murdering her daughter, I tried to tell him that I had learned where they were hiding Casey Anthony. He wouldn't take my calls. His loss, because I was already in his neighborhood, I did my own surveillance on the church where I found she was being given sanctuary. And uh, I went about my business. I did surveillance on that church. It was a way out of the way, sort of neighborhood, strange church. And I found her. And I'm thinking that this PI probably read my Daily Beast piece <laughs> about where Casey Anthony had gotten some sanctuary. I had a really good scoop. He could have deflected me. He could have, if he'd just picked up the phone and talked to a reporter, he could have bought a little time, and moved Casey Anthony, but he wouldn't take my call. Again, his loss. Let's look at some other cases where PIs and reporters work together. Uh, I worked with the attorney and the forensic examiner and the PI for the family of Rebecca Zhao. Now, you may know this case. It happened right here in Coronado, California. Uh, she was declared a suicide. She lived uh, with her boyfriend. He had a small son. The small son fell down a staircase on her watch and died. Shortly after that, she was found dead in the back of the Spreckles mansion. The coroner declared her death was a suicide over the guilt that she felt for this little boy, even though she was found bound nearly gagged, and she had somehow flown over a high balcony on the second floor of this mansion. It just didn't make sense. I met with her attorney, uh, her family's attorney, and her sister and brother-in-law when they came to visit in New York. 
Uh, and I came to believe that this was no suicide at all. After working on it, this case for a little bit, I got dumped. Hey, it happens. They decided to take the story to the Dr. Phil show because Dr. Phil could uh, spend the money to exhume her body and pay for another autopsy. So you win some, you lose some. One of my favorite cases was this one. This kid was 17 years old. His name is Martin Tankaleff. He was found guilty of stabbing to death his parents, his adoptive parents, in their wealthy home in uh, Long Island, New York. The problem is, he didn't do it. He just didn't do it. And lucky for Martin Tankaleff, there was a man, a private detective, private investigator named J. Saul Peter, who worked tirelessly to free this kid. By the way, he was in prison. He was 17 when he went in. He spent 17 years in prison. And Jay Saul Peter and a, a group of attorneys worked hard too, but it was Jay who would call me all the time, passionately talking to me about how this kid was railroaded, how they got him to confess to something he didn't do. And I didn't do a thing to help get this kid out of prison, but I like to think that uh, I raised the profile of the case by writing about it in my syndicated column. I, I wrote that you had to do something. You had to do something to listen to this kid and the new uh, information that Jay Saul Peter had gotten up. And that something turned out to be a new hearing with 20 new witnesses that Jay had found, and ultimately all the charges against Martin Tankaleff were dropped and he was set free. So look, I know that you are all of a suspicious nature. That's why you do what you do. I am too. I understand that. And some of you probably think, well, but the media is my enemy. It doesn't have to be that way. When you get that big headline-making case and you think your client might benefit from some media attention, like the family of Rebecca Zhao or the Tankaleff family, pick a reporter. Pick your reporter. I talked earlier about doing media surveillance. But sure, make sure when you pick that reporter that you're informed that you got the best one for the topic that you want to display to the world. Now, how do you do it? Start your cultivation right now, before that big case comes. Read and listen to all of the print, the TV, the uh, radio reporters. Get acquainted with their work. Uh, decide who's really giving you information that's important and who are, who's just full of crap. Don't call the ones that are full of crap, okay? I guess that goes without saying. There's a whole spectrum of journalists out there. Some of them, like me, I stick to crime and justice. That's my forte. There are some reporters that are all about uh, finance and economics. That's the kind of reporter you want to tap if you're doing a bank fraud case or, or a, a Bernie Madoff type case. Uh, there are some uh, that uh, stick to sports. So if you're doing a, a, a doping case, a steroids case, a racetrack cheating skate case, that's the kind of reporter you want to tap. But really, this is the most important thing. Any good reporter can cover any story. You just have to know, get yourself informed about whose work out there you really feel that you can trust. And then call them up. Contact them over Facebook, Twitter, whatever, if you're a tweeter, a Twitter, whatever. Contact them because I'm here to tell you, every reporter loves to get a new source. They love to be able to tell their boss, yeah, I gotta go to a meet with a source. They sound so important. So remember, you're not just their source, they're your source. They can be your source too. There may be a Sarah Ganim, remember the 24 year old Pulitzer Prize winner? There may be a Sarah Ganim operating in your neighborhood in your community, at the local paper, or broadcasting on the radio right now. You need to get to know that person. Um, in fact, you need to get to know several trustworthy reporters. Um, people on different beats. Pick them from courts, cops, education, transportation. Pick them up, get to know their work, and then get to know them as well. Just like PIs have an expertise, Joe back there goes and finds uh, abducted children Reporters have an expertise as well. It may also be that your case is big enough for the big boys. You know the ones I'm talking about, the, the uh, television 
correspondent, well, first of all, the LA Times or the New York Times or the big time television shows like 2020, 60 Minutes, 48 Hours. These are the reporters, the big boys and girls that have the budget. Um, their, their organizations, like I work for Newsweek and the Daily Beast, they can afford to send us places to really dig into stories. Um, but you don't necessarily need one of the big boys. They're harder to contact, I'll be honest with you, although they're all on Facebook because they all have an ego this big. Um, you don't necessarily need that because as we learned from the Sandusky case, a story can break locally Belfont, Pennsylvania, where the hell was that? And go national like that. And one more note about cultivating reporters. You just have to know, you have to understand that confidentiality is our bread and butter, as it is yours. It may sound corny, but it's really an unspoken oath that we have, that, and we all live by it. We do not burn our sources. We go to jail for our sources if need be. And I have friends that have done that. Judy Miller from the New York Times comes to my mind. So when you introduce yourself and you have that first cup of coffee or your first breakfast with them, they love to drink, by the way. Maybe afternoon cocktails would be better. Um, when you start to get to know them, don't forget to say, this is off the record. This is off the record. Do you agree? And any good reporter will say, yes, absolutely, I agree. And if they don't, get up, let them pay the check, and leave. Pick another reporter. Here is a quick example of about why going off the record is really, really important, and it just happened. Last week, we're all camped out in the Sandusky courtroom, and we're waiting for a verdict. And this fella, he's so jovial, that's Sandusky's lead defense attorney, Joe Amendola. He... Um, somehow forgot that there was a gag order in the case. And he came into the courtroom, and we're waiting and we're waiting. It's getting to be toward dinner time. And a reporter asked him a question. Now, we had a decorum order, and we weren't supposed to, but somebody asked him a question, and he answered it. And then more and more reporters went over to the bar to talk to him. We're right there in the courtroom. The prosecution is sitting at their side of the table with their mouth hanging over, open, Oh my God, Amendola's having like a news conference, and he was. And more and more reporters gathered around Joe Amendola asking questions. And throughout the whole thing, he, he said, now this is off the record, there's a gag order, uh, I could get in trouble, hold these quotes until after the verdict. And we all said, yeah. Except for the Associated Press reporter, who came late. And Joe forgot to say, this is off the record, when he joined the gaggle. So he asked, will you be surprised if Sandusky is found not guilty? And old Joe clutched it as hard and he said, I'd be shocked, I'd have a heart attack if he's not found not guilty. There's a Mount Everest of evidence against us. Thank you very much. And the AP reporter splits off and I thought to myself, uh-oh. Within 20 minutes, we have a dinner break. I'm walking down the hill to go to dinner, and my husband calls me from CBS Radio in New York. Did Joe Amendola just say that he was going to have a heart attack if Sandusky was... I said, yes. How do you know that? He said, it just hit the AP wire, and it's my lead story at 7 o'clock. <laughs> so, remember that mantra, off the record. Off the record? Please, off the record, until you can... You, that you feel you can trust that person. And you've all got great instincts or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. So that's the biggest takeaway from this speech. Make sure it's off the record till you want it to be on the record. And then it can still be on the record anonymously. I don't need to tell you that when you visit the scene of a crime or, or a place of interest, there are lots of common folk that just do not want to talk to an outsider. Certainly nobody with a badge Certainly nobody who looks official. Don't go to a crime scene wearing a tie. Um, they might not mind talking to a private investigator, but you probably have come up against that, hey, I got nothing to say attitude. Well, I'm here to tell you that I hardly ever come up against that. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because they recognize my face from TV, 
uh, if they think they're going to get their own reality snooky like TV show if they talk to me. I don't know if I remind them of their third grade teacher. I don't know. But people talk to me. Maybe it's because I sh show up representing no side. I, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't speak for either side in a lawsuit. I don't wear a uniform. I just show up and I say, hey, what happened? Tell me. Talk to me about this. Give me your version of the story. And they talk to me. People like to talk about themselves. And the fact is that after they talk to me, when they didn't talk to you, you should talk to me. You need to make nice nice with journalists like me to get the information you can't get. Now, look, I know that not every case, probably 90% of the cases you work on don't have a media component. But again, if I may repeat myself from the beginning of this speech, you may catch a case, a jewelry store theft, and it turns into a Lindsay Lohan stole my necklace case. You never know when that next big case is going to come around the bend and people like me are going to come in droves. They may flood into your territory and my best advice to you is do not be afraid. Be smart. Make friends. Make friends ahead of time if you can. Because the bottom line is we can be your best pal or we can be your worst nightmare. So thank you very much. I have a stack of business cards up here for anybody who would like to exchange them with me. I already have Matt's from Arizona. Thank you, Matt. And I'll be glad to take questions if you have any. Thank you very much. What's that? A little something for any questions for Diane before she steps off the stage? Go ahead. You got you have it. Take advantage of it. Go ahead. There's one. <laughs> I, Anita Bush is a friend of mine. I have not seen that, but I know how shaken up she was after Pelicano's um, various threats. It wasn't just a fish and a rose on her windshield. Why? Do you, have you seen them? Yes, I was on the defense for the Schiller brothers. It was a trap. It wasn't a car. <laughs> Let me write that down. It was a carp. Okay. Oh, it was a trout, not a carp. Gotcha. Well, yes, and Pelicano loved his Italianness, and he liked it with the baseball bat in his hand when he talked to you. Yeah, he was a real bully, and I did ultimately learn to be afraid of him. <laughs> but uh, I was glad to see him go away. Anyway, if there are any more questions, I'm going to hang around. I'm not going anywhere. So, no? Okay. Diana. Hey, come on here. Diane, on behalf of PA Magazine and the Cali organization, we'd like to thank you for speaking here today. I think everybody learned a lot of new things, and hopefully they'll start working with the media. So thank, thank you again. Only in the right, right members of the media. Yes. Thank you. That's very nice. Aw, thank you. Come, let's take a picture. You're the photographer, too. You're the photographer, too. Thanks. Well, thank you. Oh, I know right where I'll put that on my desk at home. Okay, we're going to take a 15-minute break. The vendor room is open. Please go visit the vendors, say introduce yourself, and then come on back for our next speaker, Michelle Stewart. Thank you. Yeah, you. Um, yeah. I put my cards up here. So. Oh, this is such a nice thing. Ah, Jim, Jim, yay. We're not going to ask our questions publicly. No one's going to do that.